Perfect. Um, so thanks everyone. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting us for as a speakers for the meetup. Uh, and uh, today we will tell you something about uh, uh, what we launched at reInvent. And uh, this uh, presentation is called Recap and it has a specific format where in the beginning I will uh, introduce myself and also my experience uh, with uh, reInvent. So uh, my name is uh, Jan Schwab, I'm solutions architect at AWS. And uh, together with me is Anton Lukin, who is a solutions architect here in uh, Prague office as well. Um, before uh, being solutions architect here in Prague, I was actually a software development engineer on Route 53. Um, and Anton has a development uh, background as well, uh, but his career is way more colorful. For example, he was a professional hockey player as well. Um, uh, my experience uh, with reInvent. So reInvent is a huge event uh, in uh, Las Vegas in Nevada, uh, where we uh, every year uh, introduce uh, new services. Um, and it's the largest uh, AWS conference, uh, uh, just, just the largest one. <laughs> and uh, my experience with reInvent is, uh, I've actually never been there uh, because uh, even if it might seem uh, like weird, it's way more difficult for AWS employees to get to reInvent than for anyone else, than for customers. Uh, because uh, if you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, reInvent is an event for customers, so it wouldn't really work if like half of the places were taken by AWS employees. Uh, but luckily we have uh, AWS hero Philip Pireg here who actually was at re reInvent, uh, this specific reInvent that I will be talking about. So hopefully he will be, uh, he will be willing to share uh, his experience if you ask him uh, after the talk. Okay, um, so uh, nonetheless, uh, the reInvent is a huge event where we uh, launch a lot of new services and that's what we will, we will tell you uh, about um, tonight. So um, yeah, you can see it's uh, it's a lot. Uh, we, we launch a lot of new services. So I will tell you about uh, compute, storage, networking, and security. And uh, Anton will continue with uh, with serverless and builder experience, AI, ML, and analytics. Perfect. So without further ado, uh, let's start with news from, from compute area, mainly EC2. Um, first innovation introduced at uh, this uh, reInvent is a new version of AWS Nitro. Nitro is a hardware platform uh, which uh, improves virtualization. If uh, I took this laptop or like any uh, server based on Intel CPU, it can do virtualization. I can run hypervisor on that. Uh, I can run virtual machines uh, and it will work, but uh, it will actually use the CPU power and the uh, memory of the machine for the management of the virtualization, for, for switching of the virtual machines, for for uh, keeping the, the management of the memory. And I will also need to virtualize like network card and IO in some way. And uh, if I have Nitro, I actually don't have to spend any like the host resources on that because uh, AWS Nitro is a hardware platform and it has custom built chips for, for virtualization that will handle the, the memory and the CPU resources for virtualization and uh, it will improve networking and uh, the, that. So, so the AWS Nitro is basically the difference why uh, EC2 is uh, so much better than uh, like regular virtual machines run on your on-premise server or maybe in some other clouds. Um, so thanks to this uh, hardware and software platform, um, we uh, kind of like uh, have improved uh, latency on, on network and, and also uh, security, not to forget. Uh, there is like wall uh, platform built on software and hardware in, in Nitro for security. 
however, AWS Nitro is not what we introduced. We already have it for like 10 years. Uh, what we introduced is, uh, is the new version, V5, uh, which has uh, improved uh, latency, performance, and uh, PCIe bandwidth. So it's, uh, it's another uh, generation, another step forward. Uh, together with uh, Nitro, we also introduced a new uh, revision of our third generation of uh, Graviton 3, which we introduced last summer. It's 3E. So like three, uh, Graviton 3 was introduced in summer and Graviton 3E was introduced on the reInvent. So it's new, uh, partially. And uh, built on, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, Graviton is our ARM CPU. Uh, I'm not too sure if you are uh, all aware of that, but ARM is a distinct uh, architecture different than x86. Uh, and uh, so it can run applications that are like, compiled, built for, for ARM. Uh, but luckily, like many business applications, databases and, and like uh, a lot of stuff nowadays runs on ARMs. And uh, the Graviton-based instances has uh, like better performance and at the same time, lower costs. So it's like really better value than, than uh, x86 instances. So we definitely recommend using them whenever it's possible. Uh, and built on this new generation of, of Graviton and new generation of Nitro, uh, we've introduced like new types of instances. Uh, C7GN is the newest one. Uh, it's still in preview, but uh, it will be available uh, very soon. And it's uh, built on, on this uh, latest technology. Uh, another one is HP C7G, which is uh, again the same thing, uh, but this is uh, geared towards like high performance computing. Um, another hardware uh, innovation that we introduced uh, this reInvent is uh, Inferentia 2. Inferentia is our uh, hardware chip uh, that we uh, use for machine learning. It's uh, optimized for, for machine learning workloads. Uh, so anything that can benefit from, from large machine learning models, uh, so that's tasks like, uh, like speaker, speech recognition, automated translations, generative AI, which is very popular uh, in, in recent days, um, like this, everything can, uh, can be built on, on uh, Inferentia and, and it will improve the performance um, compared to if you run the same task on, on GPU or, or CPU. Um, and uh, uh, tightly related to Inferentia is Trainium. So TR and 1N are instances built on new generation of Trainium chip. And that's uh, again for training the machine learning models. So you use like Trainium uh, for high, uh, better performance in training models and then actually run the inference on, on Inferentia. Um, another type of instance uh, uh, newly introduced is R7iZ. This is a regular 8 x6 uh, uh, based uh, instance. It's uh, not very interesting, but it's the most powerful one that we have so far. Uh, more instances, uh, we have a lot of instances. Um, so I think that's about EC2 and let's uh, take a look at storage and networking. Um, we have new uh, feature at EFS. EFS is a, a elastic file system, uh, which is our like network attached uh, file system. Uh, and uh, what, how it worked so far is that if you uh, create new EFS volume, uh, you have to uh, specify a provisioned uh, throughput for that. So you have to say how much bandwidth like in megabytes per second you need. Uh, and the v, what we introduce now is uh, elastic throughput. So we are, you just don't have to. You don't have to pay for some, some bandwidth and, and then fit into it. And you can just pay for what you use. Uh, something similar like if you are, have a DynamoDB table with uh, with uh, either on, on demand or reserved uh, capacity units. So um, 
this way you don't like uh, you are not restricted to what you allocated and at the same time you you don't pay for what you don't use so this is uh, i think a good improvement some minor improvements like uh, uh, move data to infrequent uh, access tier after one day instead of seven days and, and reduce latency um quite interesting thing is uh, which is actually related to storage is uh, SRD protocol. Uh, SRD stands for Scalable Reliable Datagram. And it's a network protocol that is a replacement for TCP. How TCP works is that uh, it takes the message that you want to send, it uh, splits it into chunks that fit into TCP packets, and then uh, sends those TCP packets over the network one by one. It waits for the acknowledgement of the uh, receiver before the sender sends another one. So this is very reliable. That's that's great because if it doesn't get acknowledgement at some time, it waits for it, and if it doesn't come, it sends the packet again. But obviously, there is some waiting time, so there is some possibility for improvement. And that's exactly what SRD does because it works the same way. It splits the message into packets but then it sends them all at once from the beginning to the end. Uh, and uh, that actually improves latency uh, by a huge uh, difference, because not only that you have uh, like better throughput by uh, sending the packets by possibly different paths in the network, which is quite possible, like in the data center, you usually have more than one path, how to reach like uh, one host uh, through the network uh, from another. Uh, so you can send them actually in parallel. Uh, and, uh, but also the main difference is that if one packet gets somehow lost, the other packets don't wait for it. So, so the message gets uh, uh, received in, in way, way better, uh, with way better latency. Uh, the mo most the, the biggest improvement in latency is on the like uh, long end uh, where on like p99 uh, and so on uh, so for for um, uh, for applications where the latency is critical this is a huge improvement uh, and that's exactly what happens with uh, networking because uh, as you know uh, uh, sorry, networking like storage, because as you know, uh, storage uh, is actually very related to networking in AWS. If you have like uh, EC2 instance, it uses EBS volume, which is physically hosted on a different machine. So uh, storage in AWS for your instances is, uh, is very related to networking. And uh, with by using SRD, uh, we have improved uh, uh, EBS IO throughput uh, like four, uh, at, at most four times. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a great improvement. Um, and uh, we've actually used uh, the same thing, SRD, uh, for um, Elastic Network Adapter Express. Um, and uh, we used it uh, for like just improving uh, network bandwidth. So this is why we I put like uh, storage and networking together because this is uh, one thing is networking and one is storage, but it's still using the same improvement. Uh, so you can just use SRD and you actually don't have to do anything. You don't have to implement SRD in your instance to, uh, to take advantage of the uh, performance improvements uh, that come with it. Uh, you just uh, need to use, uh, use this feature because uh, it's uh, transparently translated uh, from TCP at the origin and then back to TCP at the receiver's end. So there is no, no changes in your application needed. Uh, you just get the uh, improvements in, in throughput. Uh, Amazon Lattice is an application layer on networking service that gives you consistent way how to connect, secure and uh, monitor uh, service to service communication without any prior networking interface. So it's a kind of like helper in setting your networking and also communication between your services. Um, ECS Service Connect uh, is um, 
Well, ECS stands for uh, Elastic Container Service. Uh, that's our container service. It's uh, something like uh, Kubernetes, just uh, easier to manage. And uh, ECS Service Connect is a service uh, that uh, allows uh, for managed uh, service discovery and uh, communication monitoring and, and health checks in, the, uh, in ECS. And actually not only in ECS, uh, it also works like uh, not only inside the ECS cluster, but also between ECS and, and uh, your VPC resources like EC2 and so on. And uh, also in, in between like two, two separate uh, ECS uh, clusters. Um, so if you are a company and you provide to your users some application that they can use, Obviously, you want to monitor their experience and make sure that it works well for them, that the latency is, uh, is low. Uh, but you are restricted to monitoring uh, of your application that you run in the cloud or maybe in your data center, but in your cloud. And uh, uh, in, from the user's perspective, there is a lot that happens before that. There is like their ISP for connecting to the internet and all the path before it reaches your VPC in AWS. Uh, and you have no control over that. You don't even know what happens. But from user's perspective, this is all part of their experience with the application. If your application is not responsive, they don't really care if this is a like a issue of their, of their network or, or your application. They, they don't really know. Uh, but you should know. So internet uh, monitor uh, is a new feature of CloudWatch, which will tell you exactly this. We use our uh, like knowledge of our, uh, of our network and of the data that go, go to it and monitoring of uh, the, the network infrastructure, like the global AWS uh, network infrastructure. And we use this as a kind of like a baseline or, or average and we are able to compare your application uh, response rate that, that you set for monitoring uh, with this baseline. And we will tell you, okay, yeah, your application is uh, on the baseline. And actually we have detected that uh, there is some issue in this specific city and uh, with this specific ISP. So your users that are connecting from, from this place might experience something like wrong and, it, and it's, it's not you, like everyone connecting from there will experience that. So you will, you will get this information um, for, from uh, CloudWatch Internet Monitor. Um, okay, we are getting to security. Uh, AWS um, config, uh, is a tool that allows you to verify um, your existing infrastructure of, with some set of rules that you define, that you have like your security guys or, or some compliance uh, checks set up. Uh, and you will know that whether you're, you will get alerted if your infrastructure is uh, breaching some of the rules. Um, so for example, I can set up the rule that will check if I don't have some S3 bucket in this account by accident open wide to public. So the data can be, can be downloaded from that from anyone. So if it happens and it gets opened by some manual administrative uh, action in console or anything, I will get notified about that. And what we, what we launched is uh, <clears throat> AWS Config Proactive com uh, Compliance. And uh, by using this, I will actually uh, have those checks uh, done on the resources even before they are deployed. So uh, not only that I will be notified that there is some open bucket with publicly available data, but it will not even get to this state at all because it will be checked uh, on, at the time the cloud formation template is being deployed and the deployment will be blocked. So you will not get to that state in the first place. So I think that for, for like compliance, this is a great improvement. 
uh, AWS organizations uh, used to have one uh, admin account for all the organization that sets the policies. And then there are different organization units and so on. But in a large company where you have possibly like multiple organizations unit, you would like to delegate that to uh, that organization unit. So you can do that now uh, with delegated admin, which is uh, for a designed organization unit. Uh, so let's say that this is the organization and those rows are each one organization unit. So this delegated admin uh, is now uh, in the same role as the role admin for the role uh, organization, but he uh, his scope is only this organization unit. And um, oh, I, I can actually use this. I don't have to point by my hand. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, and uh, yeah, and the, the like global admin uh, can set the uh, like delegation policies. So he can set up how much is in, in, in control of this admin. So the admin is still like, can be restricted in his like administration power over his uh, organization unit. Um, AWS KMS external key store is another feature that like uh, I personally know a customer who asked for it and we delivered it on this uh, reInvent. So it's uh, really good for the customers who uh, ha are under strict regulations and for example, are not allowed to even have their uh, like cryptographic material in the cloud. They need to have it like uh, in Czech Republic, in, in their country, anywhere, uh, or like even like uh, physically in, in their like controlled data center. And uh, so far what we could do closest to this was that we generated, that the customer generated their uh, cryptographic material on their on-premise HSM like Thales or, or anything, and then uh, imported it to KMS. So the cryptographic material was under their control. They could rotate it and so on, but they still had it to, had to uh, have it in the cloud at some point to be able to uh, to encode, uh, encrypt anything with that. And now it's possible uh, to actually have like external key store, key store uh, which is registered with KMS and um, KMS will reach to the on-premise external HSM uh, for every single use of that key and the key will never be actually leaving the on-premise data center. So this is an improvement for customers who um, are in regulated industries like banks. And uh, Amazon Inspector for Lambda functions is a new feature of Amazon Inspector. Amazon Inspector allows you to inspect your code that you deploy to containers or to EC2 instances for common, commonly known vulnerabilities. So it will check your dependencies and see, okay, so you are deploying this version of this dependency, but actually uh, there is a CVE about that and it is marked as a uh, um, compromised. So you really need to update your code to this version of your dependency. And now it's available for Lambda functions as well. And because you already see Lambda functions, you know that we are getting to serverless part and with that, I would like to ask uh, Anton to continue. Thank you. Super. Hello, everyone. Oh, hopefully, you can hear me. Nice. So I have this luxury to be last. So everyone is a little bit tired. So let's do it a little bit interactive today with you. So how many people use some sort of serverless? You guys, oh, quite a lot. Nice, nice. To be honest, I was not expecting, but Fargate yeah, it's... Not yeah, yeah, not Fargate, like really serverless. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't have to say it, but yeah. So uh, the first announcement uh, we have is related to AWS Lambda. We already had one before, but for AWS Lambda, especially for Java lovers, uh, we have a special feature. Uh, how many actually are using Java with lambdas? And with lambdas? Yeah? Nice, nice, okay. Nice. 
So, uh, do you experience a cold start? Actually, cold start. Cold start when you have initiation of your like lambda function. Yes, yes, it is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that it is there. So that's why we implemented it because like we had a like a pretty big amount of customers who was complaining actually about uh, specifically about Java and its cold start because for some bigger applications it can be like five seconds, 15 seconds sometimes. What does it mean is that like you have some sort of initialization, uh, initialization phase when uh, environment is set up and it downloads your code, spin up uh, the environment and so on. And it takes some time. So for some languages like uh, Node.js or uh, Python, it can take like 200 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, which is fine. For Java, five, 15 seconds, which is not really acceptable. <laughs> so uh, currently it works only for Java 11. Uh, but the good thing is uh, that it is free of charge. So you just need simply check, like check checkbox uh, in console or uh, just set up like few parameters in CDK, cloud formation and so on, whatever you use and it works. It has some, it has some limitations. Uh, so for example, you cannot use EFS, uh, elastic file storage for VZ and uh, some other few. So please read documentation first before you will use it. So yeah, but it is a cool, a cool feature. Uh, also I have a slide like a little bit to explain how does it work. So you have this initial phase, which takes time, the environment is set up, blah, blah, blah. And only then your Lambda is running your actual business code. Uh, with snap start, what does it do? So when you're deploying a new version of your Lambda function, it runs uh, the whole, oh actually, Oh yeah, I have a laser. So <laughs> yeah, so it ran, uh, runs the whole this init phase, uh, create a snapshot of your Lambda function or uh, Firecracker, store it into S3. And then when you are launching your uh, Lambda function, actually you are just like spinning up by calling the API, it just download uh, the snapshot and resume it. So it is much faster process. For example, like just today I tried uh, also a uh, few tricks, like if you will set up simple Lambda function uh, in Java, just like hello world with, uh, without snap start, cold start takes like about 600 milliseconds, which is not so much, but like, it is super simple application. With snap start, it downloads the code from S3 by like 50 milliseconds. So it is like quite a huge improvement, like 10 times, for example, in this specific case. Uh, of course, everything it changes case by case, but yeah, worth to try. The next one in serverless, um, we have announced a new feature for Evanbridge. Evanbridge, does anyone like, do you know what is it? Do we have anyone who doesn't know what is it? Okay, so yeah, so it is even broker, even, even bus. So it is something like a you know, combination of SQS, SNS, uh, and it does some features on top of it. So it is like for orchestration of your events between microservices. But what happened before when you have a different technology stack uh, for your different microservices, you had to write some sort of glue code around it. So like, for example, transform your data, get some additional data, enrich your JSON document by some other uh, data and so on. So now we have some sort of uh, some sources like and targets, which you can, um, how to say, set up as connectors within your event bridge. And also you have some additional filtering options, enrichment options. So as an example, what you can do, for example, you have an SQS queue with events and you need somehow to populate them to step function. And you need also to enrich this data. For example, you have a uh, customer order. You need to add some user details about his email, I don't know, and so on doesn't really matter. So what you will do, you connect SQS here as a source. You will set up additional enrichment by calling, for example, API gateway and Lambda behind. It will take user data. It will provide it to event bridge. Event bridge adds this data into the event and then push it directly to step functions. So you don't have to, die to do anything with that. It's just like uh, how it was set today 
click ops or, <laughs> or or you can use infrastructure as a, as a code of course and recommended way yeah so this is it and the next one uh is open search and yes finally we have it serverless i know some guy who should be really yeah waiting for it <laughs> uh so uh for example we used open search quite heavily on one of our customer and uh it was actually the only piece we could not set up as a serverless like fully serverless we used everything uh like api gateways lambdas and so on but open search was the only piece which you still have to deal with ec2s yes managed ec2s but still it's not so like easy to do and so on uh and now here it is <laughs> actually already in general availability so you can try it out uh, it also has some limitations so be aware of them uh, you need to read documentation first play with that build some sort of poc by the way if you know your account manager aws can provide you credits for it so please ask for them really helpful and in relation to open source serverless actually how we did it we didn't just like some sort of lift and shift like we redo the whole architecture of uh open search under the hood so for example we separated indexing part from search part so it can scale independently one from another and also decoupled uh, compute from storage so right now all your data will be stored on s3 so you will benefit from all of its features like huge durability availability failovers and so on uh, also when you are setting up your cluster you can define how big like how much should scale your indexing part and search part so for example again on our client before uh, we had very heavy load on indexing part but not so much on the search part but because we had everything on like same worker nodes we had to scale all of them at once uh in some other cases uh, it can also affect your overall performance for example if you have uh sudden spikes in queries so it can affect your indexing in previous world right now you can scale all of these parts independently so first of all it will be cost optimized and it will not affect uh, each other so yeah pretty nice stuff uh, of course, everything is uh, fail tolerant with re read replicas and so on. So it scales up, scales down, uh, all of this fancy stuff. And now we will go to AI, ML, and analytics. Uh, do we have some data engineers here, data scientists at all? Oh, no one. Uh, uh, like a little bit, yeah. Okay, so we will try to be quick and productive here because yeah, not many people are interested <laughs> so uh the main the main feature what we introduced is related to SageMaker, a new generation of notebooks for SageMaker studio and first feature in this relation is um, building data preparation so it is like doesn't run again oh come on yeah yeah now you can see it so it builds some sort of visualization on top of your tables so you can uh, visualize your data distribution of your data if you have some missing values uh, and so on uh, it also provides uh, like it is generating your some recommendations and codes how you can uh, restructure your data fill these missing values and so on and so on so uh, pretty nice stuff for data engineers but let's move on uh, the next one is a uh, collaboration tool. So it's called shared spaces. So it basically like when someone is type typing something in SageMaker notebook, you can see it right away without any delays. You can work on this together. So yeah, nice stuff. Yeah, done, let's go. <laughs> nice. And the last feature for SageMaker notebooks, uh, and it is actually like pretty awesome feature. It's like simplifies workflow quite drastically. So when you are building your notebooks, previously you had to build some sort of CI CD pipelines to actually like uh, build your jobs, uh, deploy it to some infrastructure, run this, like set up some scheduling 
and so on and so on. So right now what you can do, you can just say that, hey, I have developed my notebook. I want to use it like in production. Uh, you, you set it up and then what it does, it creates the snapshot of your notebook. You are specifying how you want to run it on demand. So you just like initiating it or by some schedule like daily, weekly and so on. And what it does, it takes your container image, prepare the whole infrastructure for it, deploy it there, run it. When it is finished, it will shut it down completely. So you don't have to pay for any resources. It follows all uh, AWS best practices, uh, scales automatically, spin up resources, scale down resources. You don't have to pay for idle time. So yeah, nice stuff. And especially like a SageMaker is mainly for data scientists not DevOps engineers or like developers, developers. So it really simplifies their lives. They don't have to go to DevOps engineers every time and say, hey guys, guys, we need to set up something. They can do everything on their own. And the last one in data analytics ML AI area is Amazon Athena for Apache Spark. Uh, Again, so Apache Spark, quite specific scenario, but actually like a lot of big clients were asking us like how they can run, like still be fully serverless, but already run Apache Spark complex queries when Athena is not enough. And let's be honest, Athena is not so, it, it, it is powerful, but it is lacking some like super complex and powerful queries. So that's why we introduced Apache Spark for Athena. <coughs> Uh, you can run your Python scripts with Spark and so on and everything in serverless manner. So you don't have to spin up your EMR clusters for it. Do all of this mumbles jumbles around just like to do some queries on S3 bucket. So yeah, easy stuff. Yep. So this was it for ML, AI and data analytics. The next one, builder experience. And yeah, as I saw, we have a lot of serverless guys here, which is nice. I love it. So the first tool, application composer. Uh, actually, it is already not in preview. Yesterday, it was just announced that it is already general, avail uh, general availability state. So it is available for everyone to use. Uh, what does it do? It is a visual builder for your serverless applications. So it is like simple drag and drop uh, stuff and then it generates you infrastructure as a code. Let's jump into the next slide. So how does it work and how it look? So you have uh, canvas and you have building blocks like API gateway, lambdas, SQS, SNS, even bridge, Dy DynamoDB and so on and so on. You just drop it here, connect it all together. You, will, you can select, for example, specific pieces and set up some uh, variables for it, for example, Hey, I want API gateway to have this method. So get use items, post items, users, I don't know, whatever. Connect it with specific lambdas, do some sort of authorization, store these items then in the name of table and so on. And it will generate you the whole infrastructure what needs to be created. And it will be stored here in this template uh, folder, yeah. So, also nice stuff, what you can do with that, you can connect it with your local IDE on your local uh, computer and uh, store all of these files on your local machine or very nice stuff. And actually even for experienced developers. So uh, what you can do with that, uh, you can upload your own uh, cloud formation and some scripts uh, into like as a template and it will generate you some sort of view. You can then drag and drop it. So it is super easy and like nice stuff for generation your documentation. You don't have to play with draw IO to build all of these blocks around. It will just generate everything for you and you can do a screenshot from it and share with your guys, with your team and so on. Also super nice for some prototyping POC phase when you don't really want to struggle with setting up everything. You just like click, click ops your infrastructure and done. <laughs> yeah, so worth to try. The next one, uh, Code Whisperer, Amazon Code Whisperer. So most probably everyone has experience with ChatGPT, right? I don't have to say what is it. 
So Code Whisperer, it is a specific tool for generating code for like, it is like for generating code. <laughs> How does it work? You are just writing your comments. What do you want to achieve? For example, upload data to S3 bucket, get data from DynamoDB and upload it somewhere else. I don't know, do some transformation and so on. And because it is machine learning models, uh, it was uh, trained on open source data and Amazon code actually. Uh, it follows our best practices and it can provide you several variants how you can achieve your goal. And you can even like select like few variants of it, you can then change it and so on. And nice stuff is that it is, first of all, uh, available in many popular IDEs like Visual Studio Code, JetBrains, uh, Cloud9, yes, very popular IDE. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, I actually like it, yeah. <laughs> uh, and nice stuff that you can use just your AWS Builder ID so you don't have to have uh, AWS, full AWS account. So it is easier to try it out. So yeah, nice stuff. And we have some other services and features. Uh, once again, we didn't present everything because like we announced like more than 100 new services, features and so on and so on. So like initial presentation, what we were working with, with Jan, it was like huge, huge amount. It would, it would take us, I don't know, five hours maybe to present everything. So we tried to really select the most interesting, most applicable parts for us here on the local market for you guys. But in general, we have much more updates, like, I don't know, Comprehend for IDE, some IFS distributed map for step functions. I don't know what could be here interesting. Geospatial machine learning, Aurora zero util integration to Redshift and so on and so on. So really a lot of it. And by the way, everything is available uh, on YouTube channel as well, all keynote sessions, uh, all special breakout sessions. It is not only about announcements, but also like, for example, how to set up secure infrastructure, some just best practices, how to work with S3 buckets and so on and so on. So a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Another news. 100% of, of renewable energy by 2025. So we are overachieving our goals. It was 2030 before, uh, 2030, now 2025. Good stuff for the planet, especially in current crisis. Uh, and by 2030, we will be water positive, what it, which means that we will produce more water than we will consume by AWS. <laughs> maybe by sweating engineers <laughs> in US East one when it is down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yeah. And uh, the last thing which I wanted to share with you. So guys stay in touch with AWS community. We have much more events coming up uh, locally, internationally, globally. Uh, so here is again, some core codes. Please, if, you're, if you didn't join our Slack channel, join it. Yeah, guys are really trying to make best of it. So yeah. And what else? Like we have some events for developers, global events. You can participate in them. We have uh, our Twitter, you can follow it and so on. Uh, we have Twitch. Yeah, like, I don't know, like, yeah, but why not? <laughs> <laughs> And YouTube, of course, YouTube, not only build on AWS, but I definitely recommend every, everyone interesting uh, to follow our AWS channel where we are posting all reinvent stuff uh, from summits, videos, and so on. So interesting stuff. And questions? <laughs>